All right. Three, two, one. What's up, Nathan Kroc? How you doing, man? I'm doing quite doing? well. Thank you for having me. It's been me here. forever since I've seen you. you went, we went to high school together. Graduated in 2006. Graduated yeah. in 2006. Like I was telling you um, before we started recording, uh, for some reason you and I were in a bunch of the same classes. I have no idea why, because I was way dumber than you. <laughs> and the one thing that sticks out to me was that you were showing me some diagrams of how you ha- were planned on putting your brain into a cyborg one day. Yeah. And I, I never forgot about that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I did, as does <laughs> most of my nonsensical ideas. I, I dream big and yeah. do outlandish things. And it's, you sure this isn't the cyborg version of you here right now? And you're just not telling us? Of course not. Okay. That's completely normal. <laughs> All right. I believe you. That's incredible, man. So I had to look you up, and I'm glad that you uh, agreed to come on this. It's super cool. Yeah, my pleasure. I apologize in advance. I've been on. A little sick. I can't really imagine what I sound like in the microphone. Probably like so one of those glorious, like, like a kidnapper <laughs> filter, right? <laughs> Bring the briefcase and the money to the boom, to the bridge by midnight. Yeah, we could put some effects on some auto tune, maybe or something. Yeah. <laughs> so what is it? So for those people out there who may not know, um, and I actually don't know how to say it myself, but what exactly yeah. do you do? So uh, I do two things. I do research in uh, machine learning, which Mm -hmm. is colloquially referred to as artificial intelligence. We can talk maybe about the distinction between those two things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second is I work, uh, I direct the NUSI Labs, which is an R&D division of a machine learning company in Tallahassee. So we have a lot of government contracts, contracts with big businesses, agencies, and uh, we offer some very common machine learning services. And our job in the labs division is to ensure that all the services that we are offering are cutting edge. We look up the latest research, check out the papers, go into the code, and make sure that we're able to keep things uh, as impressive and useful as possible to our customers. All right, what kind of things do you uh, do there, like to sum it down? Sure. What, what are you guys researching on in uh and doing that. Yeah, so for example, uh, one of the contracts that we work on is with uh, uh, 911 emergency phone calls. So that's a very big industry, as I'm sure we can all imagine, and they have thousands of calls a day. Um, Monitoring these calls is uh, very difficult. Uh, Often they're not able to monitor more than 1% or less of the phone calls that actually come through for quality assurance. So what we're doing is we take all of the calls and we train a speech to text engine. So we take the audio transcripts and we, uh, the audio calls and we transcribe it to text. Okay. Then once we have all the text, we use natural language processing techniques to analyze what's going on, emotion, sentiment, keywords, names, addresses, what's going on. And we can use this to filter and flag potential dangerous calls. Maybe, maybe somebody calls and says, hey, I feel like I'm going to kill myself and right. the telecommunicator <laughs> Oh, okay, well, go ahead. You know, right. something outlandish and right. uh, a call like that should be monitored and that telecommunicator should be flagged. So right. the services we offer allow them to monitor their calls more efficiently and also improve training. For example, we can identify target words. Maybe a telecommunicator uses a certain word and there's always a spike in maybe anger, fear, or something in the caller. And we can uh, let the agency know that these certain words are probably not best to be used for calls of this type. And uh, so that's just one of the projects that we work on. Wow. And what, what is the purpose of this company? I mean, like, what, what's, your, what's the goal? Like, what are you trying to develop? Like, I understand, like, you guys are analyzing the calls, the behavior of the people that are calling in. But, like, what is the, like, the long-term goal? Sure. Of- so, I mean, the people that come together, we would call ourselves uh, social entrepreneurs, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, we all have some sort of outlandish, idealistic notions of good and trying to impose that on everybody else, whether they agree with us or not, as I think yeah. everybody <laughs> actually does, which we will probably get into when we start talking about what yeah. is intelligence and learning. Um, and so we try to take on projects that are consistent with our visions and ambitions of trying to improve things for the economy, to do good with machine learning. Okay. So essentially... With 911 calls down the road, you think that maybe humans won't be doing that? or We've entertained those ideas. That's yeah. a bit further down the road. Yeah. We are working on mm. what we call a language model in, in the field right. of machine learning, where right. we take all these transcripts and we have a certain yeah. uh, uh, algorithm or, or engine which yeah. looks at all the text and starts learning the intrinsic properties of what 911 domain phone calls are like. And we can actually synthesize new speech with language models like that. And idealistically, one would dream that down in the future, we could potentially uh, replace telecommunicators with agents. 
intelligence. That's obviously a very wow. saucy topic, but yeah. the, the short term goal is perhaps a training simulator okay. to help the telecommunicators get used to what certain callers might sound like. Maybe we can simulate uh, homicide calls or they're even, I mean, you get, you wouldn't believe the kind of things that we listen to in these 911 yeah. calls. Like sometimes we'll just get some old lady. She's like, well, um, my back hurts, so I need an ambulance here immediately. <laughs> just yeah. All kinds. And the right, telecommunicator the, the chuckles. Opposite. Yeah. I'm sure you get it all. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, so I mean, the short-term goal would be yeah. perhaps a training simulator. And then yeah. long-term idealistic goals would be uh, aiding and right. uh, putting telecommunicators, making them be a bit more automated. Right. So, I mean, just going back to high school, you've obviously been extremely passionate about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. What? What? What was it that initially got you interested in all this stuff? What made you, what turned you into this person you are right now? Yeah, that's kind of a long and tumultuous road, but I can probably summarize <laughs> it uh, a little bit more poetically than it probably was, as yeah. we often do in media. Um, it, you know, so again, being like this social entrepreneur, I've always had this, again, unreasonable desire to just do good for yeah. no other reason than it just makes me happy. And so when we're young and idealistic, everybody's like, oh, world peace, what a great novel idea that is. And then as you grow up, it usually just becomes a laughing point because such a thing is often nonsensical and imaginary. Um, but when I was young, I, I had convinced myself that uh, the reason we don't obtain peace is because individuals don't understand one another. And when I mean understand, I don't mean in the sense of like, you listen to me and you hear me. I mean in the sense of like, you feel what I feel. And, and such in the sense that if I killed somebody, to truly understand me, you would have to replay the feelings, decisions, and the actions that I did such that you would have literally killed the person too. There's, yeah. there's no deeper understanding yeah. than that. So my ambitions were, I'm gonna go into neuroscience, come up with a way to map memories and then replay them in other people's minds so that they can learn other people's feelings. Again, these big idealistic outlandish dreams. <laughs> I love that shit. So that was where I started. When, and what time is that? How old are you when you start thinking like that? That was probably- Middle school, elementary school? No, that was probably uh, high, high school. school. I mean, sh shortly after high school, perhaps. Yeah. You know, in high school, we're, we don't really know who we are, or what we want. We're trying to figure right. things out in life. And yeah. your friends teach you what life is. Your parents teach you what life is. Yeah. So that's a messy minefield of disasters. Yeah. <laughs> you used to be a boxer too, right? <laughs> Yeah, another one of those young... You're not doing I, that anymore? I do it from time to time. It's good to stay healthy. It's it good is. to feel like you can protect yourself and your loved ones. Yeah. Uh, I used to coach FSU's boxing team. So really? Oh, that's cool. Participate that's fucking awesome, man. And coach a little bit when I can. Hell but, yeah. Uh, you still do that? You're doing that anymore or just dabble in it? I mean, we used to uh, own a boxing gym. So when we oh, coached really? FSU's team, we had the Renegade Boxing Gym for yeah. a long time. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, I'm participating in the Savage Race on Sunday uh -huh. with one of the old trainers from uh, Renegade Boxing. And our team name, for the Savage Races, you know, Renegade Boxing Team. So oh, that's, that's awesome. A little bit of nostalgia there. That's That'll really be fun. Cool, dude. Yeah, no doubt. But, I uh, want to try one of those one day. We should try one. Yeah, I would die. You think we can make it? <laughs> I think you guys got it. The Warrior Dash yeah. is the way to go, right? So check this out. In the Warrior Dash, it's short, muddy, messy. There's barbed wire and fire. All yeah. right? You run through this thing. You have a lot of fun. You laugh. You get messy. You get dirty. Everybody's usually pretty fit when they go out there in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And then you cross the finish line. And everybody's screaming. As soon as you cross the finish line, they hand you like a big chalice of beer. You get oh, like yeah. a big Viking helmet and a huge chicken leg. And oh, everybody else yeah. is around you just like drenched and usually pretty fit and pretty, often pretty sexy. And yeah. you just got adrenalines and beer and meat. And it's a pretty great experience. I would that sounds you. great. What's that, that sounds called? Awesome. Uh, that one's called the Warrior Dash. The Warrior, Warrior Dash. Dash. I'm checking that <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, we for definitely sure. have to check that out. That sounds <laughs> amazing. I'm definitely checking it out. That whole getting into the boxing thing started when I was, uh, this was actually a middle school thing, right? So, one of my big inspirations was Leonardo da Vinci, mm -hmm. and he is known as the Renaissance Man, right? And so, I'm like, that's me. I want to be the modern day Renaissance Man. That's going to be my big goal. And so, I tried to do as much as I could. You know, I did combat, I took you know, martial arts, boxing, yeah, yeah. dance, play music, study languages, uh, sciences, as much as I could to experience as much life as possible. Only to realize that in this overpopulated world of specialization, the notion of a modern day renaissance man is just isn't really achievable any longer. <laughs> uh, the amount of time necessary to become a true master of any one discipline is a lifetime. For mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So, that so was you tried to do a bunch of different things. Tried to do it all. Yeah. But it's, it's good to experience a little bit of everything. Yeah, and so I, I'm, I might have uh, uh, psychologically convinced myself that instead of being a master of one thing, I'm a master of being mediocre at many things. That's all right. Yeah, right? I like it. <laughs> it has master in the title. It's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Speaking of uh, stretching yourself, I just tried not eating for three days, and that was like the worst experience of my life. Good for you, man. I, I didn't. I, I should have done it with other people who were doing the same thing, but... Um, 
I was around people that were just gorging every oh. day, and it was just basically like torturing myself. You but I was trying. It was like a healthy thing. I was trying to be healthy. You know what I mean? Trying to clean out my my body, my cells, and yeah. And uh, gives you a little sympathy to people doing Lent and Ramadan, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Really fast. yeah, right. For sure. <laughs> he was going to go 10 days. I was like, I'll give you about four, maybe five tops. He made yeah. it about three. I made it 72 hours. Have you ever tried that? Honestly, I have. And not more than a few days ago, I was telling my uh, girlfriend that I was going to try and go oh, really? seven days because seven. I just have eaten too much crap. And then there's the eggnog and then there's the beer and then I get gassy and then I'm just miserable and I just want to like cleanse myself. And so I've psychologically convinced myself that fasting is somehow the way to do that. Right. I don't really know what Yeah, it's like the rage right now. Everyone's talking about it. It's like the new <laughs> yeah. thing to talk about and do. <laughs> so you have done it before? I have. How yeah. many days? Uh, well, I did it back when I was in college. One of my friends was doing the Lent thing for yeah. uh, Catholicism, and I just did it with him for a week. One was, week. Was Seven miserable. days. Yeah. How what did you do, you do what, it? What do you do all? You just drink lots of water. That's and, it. Uh, yeah. But you can't be around other people that are eating, right? You can if you have discipline. I um, did not have enough of it, so I often just avoided people when they were eating, going out, or something like that. But. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was nice. I mean, it kind of changes your, the first few days, it's like, oh, I got this. This is great. You know, you have people who like to endure the, the suffering a little bit or they like yeah. to endure the hardships, you know, yeah. turmoil. And then that turmoil starts to like, starts to screw with your psychology a little bit. Everybody likes to think that they can endure hardships, but the reality is, is that it actually becomes like an intellectual war inside your mind. Yeah, it's not it as easy, it's just I'm not gonna do it because right. your mind is like convincing you that it's okay to do it. Well, it's unhealthy for me to not do it. I need to eat or else I'm gonna kill myself and I don't wanna kill myself, right. this is just a game, right? right? You play these games with yourself and yeah. it becomes very difficult. I learned a lot yeah. when I did it. The hard thing for me was thinking about like having this many days left. Like I'm like, I'm only t <laughs> a th a one tenth of the way through, I'm only, you know, two thirds of the way through. I'm not even close to halfway through, and I, I gotta go five more days. Like that made it impossible for me. You, but you, if I could have just thought about it, like I'm just gonna go today without eating, wake up the next day a brand new day. I'm just gonna go today without eating. Like if I could have done that every day, if I could have somehow tricked myself, I think that would have been way easier. Did you nail it? Um, there's a book by uh, Stephen King called The Long Walk. Uh, it's a great book, um, basically just about enduring hardship. Yeah. Um, and in that book, I, uh, and from a friend of mine, I learned the value, very valuable lesson when you're like running marathons, half marathons training yeah. is that, and this just translates to everything in life, is you just say, just put one foot in front of the other. Right. That's all I got to yeah. do. I just got to put my foot, one foot in front of the other. All right, I'm here now. I just got to put one foot in front of the other. And everything just becomes so easy. Then you, you turn around, you wake yeah. up, you're 40, and you, you know, you've built right. the Great Wall of That's China. That's amazing, you know? man. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, man. It's, it really is. The, just the... It's just scary to think about, like, having to take a thousand steps and try to, like, look at the top of the mountain. I'm going to have to get there. Holy shit, I'm going to die. Yeah. Instead of, like, one foot in front of the other, it's a lot easier. It makes it a, little, a lot easier for sure. <laughs> so what's up with uh, this AI? T tell me a little bit about some stuff I don't know. AI, what is... World's coming to an end, man. What is what they say, right? super digital intelligence? Yeah, so a lot of buzzwords float <laughs> around. They often get misinterpreted by a lot of people. Um, Super intelligence, digital intelligence is super intelligence, digital medium. Um, but in general, super intelligence is just any form of intelligence, whatever that means, which we'll probably need to define in a moment, um, that su surpasses humans mm -hmm. in vast regard, oftentimes. So, um, you know, l let's actually take a moment and, and talk about what is intelligence, right? Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. like, just uh, curiously, like, what do you guys, how would you guys define intelligence if somebody asked you? Uh, I would say it's just trial and error of failing or not failing and then kind of adding those up to knowing which path mm -hmm. you're going to take next, right? The saying, like, if a brand new baby crawls off the couch and hit its, hits its face on the ground, the first time, chances are the next time it's on the edge of the couch, it's not going to keep crawling and fall off the couch, mm. right? So that's just so like, it's like a level of knowledge, of maybe, or... That's one of the key words that, w that is used in the machine learning definition. Okay. But yeah, you're sort of revolving around the same principle. Uh, there is no academic, like, 100% definition, or rather, there are many. There's no accepted definition. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, a common theme among all of them is there's two pieces to intelligence. One is a fundamental requirement to acquire information. You have to somehow just ingest information. And then two is you need to have some functional ability to act on that information and interact with the world that your intelligence is embedded in, be okay. it digital or biological. So... Um, one thing that I, I like to sort of interpret that is by saying the mind itself is embodied and then the body is embedded. So let's just take the notion of the brain for a moment. And outside the brain, there's this complete universe of information. 
we have absolutely no idea what the vastness of that information is because our brain, all of our senses are just making tiny, infinitesimal approximations to this vast amount of information that's out there. As an analogy, the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, the you know, radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays, visible light, ultraviolet, right, and you have all this whole spectrum, uh, we can only see an absolutely teensy-weensy little sliver of that. And there's so much more information out there that's just literally not going into our brain. All right, so, and so what we say is that the little bit of information that does come into the brain, though, we have to internalize it, create an internal model of that information, and then be able to interact and act on that knowledge in an intelligent way. <laughs> and how, how do people determine, how do you determine or how do people choose or do they not choose what gets input into them? What pieces of information are input into them? Is that just like... They have absolutely the people no choice. They're around. It's just the, you, right now you're getting all kinds of information. The, the light that's hitting you, the sounds that are coming into your ears, the feel of the table. Okay. I mean, every sensory medium is just ingesting information right. all day long, 100% of the time. Right. You have no choice. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, you have an alleged perceived <laughs> choice. We'll get into this whole free will thing probably eventually, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, allegedly, you move yourself to another environment, you change the stimulus that's presented to your system. But wow, yeah. So I've always thought to myself, I never really talked about it, but like, for instance, conversations like this that get recorded and uploaded to the internet, hundreds, millions of hours every day. Is that not just fucking training some crazy AI that's going to be able to download everything, every bit of knowledge that humans have ever known in like two seconds? Yeah, and it's a fun thing to think about. I mean, there's a couple of, of hurdles along the way. The first and the most staggering is the need and the requirement to aggregate that information, right? So, I mean, as you know, you get all these files, you put them on computers, you record from this microphone through the wire, you have it here locally. But as you say, there's hundreds, thousands of hours of video. Well, for one entity to be able to, or entity, intelligent system to right. be able to ingest that knowledge, all of that information must somehow be available to it to ingest in the very precise medium that it needs for it to be ingested. Right. And that's a, that's a very, very difficult hurdle to overcome. Right. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, for, for example, you might have heard about a lot of the uh, facial recognition, image recognition, et cetera. Yeah. For the longest time, these image recognition systems could only operate on images of a very specific resolution. They just didn't have an ability to generalize to different sized images. Mm -hmm. So now you say, oh, well, there's all these pictures out there on the mm -hmm. Internet. Yeah, but only those that are exactly whatever, 127 by 324 pixels can this one system ingest. Mm -hmm. all right? And so over time, we learned about this handicap and we generalized to different techniques right. that allow us to you know, examine different resolution images. But right. you know, it, it, basically transducing information that's out there, be it digital right. or physics or whatever it is, into some system and then aggregating it is a very, very complicated system, let alone then learning on that information and being able to interact on it. Just ingesting is a huge problem that we still uh, are having a very hard time grappling with. Wow. And do you, in general, do you have more of an optimistic view of the future of this artificial intelligence or do you have more of a concerned view, kind of like versus the Elon Musk's outlook? You know, he's very you know, pessimistic about it, very cautious yeah. about it. And then like people like Mark Zuckerberg who are like, you know, why would you be scared of it? This is great. This is helping us. Yeah. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. There's, there's an underlying theme in a lot of the way that I ap approach all these problems. And that is to truly understand something, be neither for nor against it. And then the truth will be laid bare before you. So I do the best I can to not really have overwhelmingly strong opinions about things because that just limits the amount of information that I'll be able to ingest and to understand for it. You know, there's some really outlandish examples that can sort of demonstrate this. Uh, you know, let's say that somebody's walking down the sidewalk and they take, uh, you know, a little knife and they, and they stab an old lady. And then, you know, well, what is that? Well, what happened? Is it good? Is it bad? Why? You know, people like to analyze these things and try and throw labels on it. But... The reality is, is if you zoom out enough, it is neither good nor bad. It, it merely is. It, it right. just happened. She's going to, without medical attention, probably fall over and die. You know, this, these are just things. But let's zoom out a moment and say, oh, well, what are some ways to interpret it? Well, if I didn't know anything and I just saw it happen from the other sidewalk, I'd be like, this is horrible. How could this person do this? He took the life of yeah. a, an old lady. But little did I know there was information unavailable to me that she had bombs on her chest and was about to blow up the whole city. And some guy just saved hundreds and thousands of lives. 
Okay. Right. All right. Okay. So you see how the ability to interpret this information is just, you know, intrinsically subjective. Right. And that becomes very uncomfortable for a lot of people. So when I think about the questions, uh, you know, about is it good or is it bad, I think it's both and it's neither. And depending on certain assumptions that people have about what is essentially right or wrong, you can make an objective framework and then start arguing, well, this is good or this is bad. But mm -hmm. if you change those assumptions, now you have a different objective framework and now you can argue whether it's good or bad there. So I try to be flexible to entertain different people's opinions about what is right or wrong and then we can really right. explore the possibilities. Right. I mean, I don't really have it. I just kind of like, I don't have an opinion myself. I don't really know enough about it, but I assume like you know uh, substantially more than the average person does about the future of this stuff. Sure. So, That's a good question. I mean, so. you mean, you don't have any kind of emotional, like, like reaction to it? I mean, of obviously. Of course I have emotions. I'm not a cyborg. Okay. <laughs> right. I'm just making sure. I don't know. Well, I might have to ask your girlfriend to confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to create a machine that scans your face and figures out if you are a cyborg or not. But we d Forrest hasn't developed that yet for us. <laughs> but, mm. I mean, no, no. No feelings towards, you know, what could happen, what, what may not happen. Like, you're not weighing towards one or the other. Like, what are your, what are your thoughts on it? It's a great question. And if I'm, I'll just be entirely honest. Um, I feel all of them, right? I mean, yeah. and I, I do the best I can as a scientist to sort of take in the feeling that I feel, analyze why I feel it, look at the repercussions of that feeling. Then I take another feeling, look at these and analyze it and try and get a whole picture. You know, for yeah. example... I'm excited. AI is an amazing phenomenon. I mean, yeah. how it helps us underst understand ourselves at such a deeper level is yeah. very difficult to communicate to uh, people who haven't really been immersed in it for a long time. You know, mm -hmm. as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, like, scientifically literate people just see the world differently. Well, I would take that a step further and say machine learning or artificial intelligence literate people just see themselves and humans differently. So that's a, an exciting thing. You know, we might be able to share this thing, these things we discover. Yeah. But of course, everybody has many fears. You know, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and that warrants fear and caution. Yeah. And you know, we need to be careful and make sure that we have a lot of checks and balances to right. make sure that things don't get out of control. And we can talk about those things. Right. They're yeah. very saucy topics. Yeah, it is. For it's sure. crazy. I feel like one day it's just going to be just like the Terminator, and, and <laughs> fucking everything is going to just be robots, and we're all gone. <laughs> Let's do a thought experiment. Right? Yeah. So let's say that I am an ardent environmentalist and I love the earth more than anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. So again, you know, we talk about these <clears throat> values. My objective values are the preservation of nature and, and the earth. Mm -hmm. So I develop some amazing artificial intelligence system that's going to solve all the world's problems. Global warming is going to tell me how to fix it and tell me what to do. Okay, and this thing starts learning. It collects all this data. It learns about people. And it decides, well, I think the earth would be a lot better if we just got rid of all the people. Right. And so it goes and does that. So the question is, is that good or is it is Which it, it should, right? <laughs> that's what it was supposed to do. And as right. the person who is, environment, is interested in the environment... I should theoretically say, well, this is consistent with my values and it's achieving my goals and my ambitions. So <laughs> that's, that's the problem with right, right and wrong is it's, mm -hmm. only subject, it's only relative to your subjective value system. And so people talk about, well, if, what if robots come and take over and kill all the planets well, or all the, all the people? Well, provided that we are all interested in self-preservation, that's an awful thing, you know, clearly. Yeah, right. I happen to agree. I, I'm, I like living. Living is good. Dying yeah. is not as good. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, on that bandwagon as well. But it's just not as easy. I just don't think it's quite as easy as is often advertised. No, it's definitely very complex. Um, I mean, the same thing with, with self-driving cars, right? Like, with yeah, how do you train fun like, the values? Like, how, the car has to avoid hitting something getting into a car accident, like I think Forrest was telling me that one of the new, I think it was Tesla or someone, they were, they were saying that they were training the cars to avoid, primarily avoid hitting other cars, meaning that if it ha the car has to decide between hitting another car or hitting a pedestrian, yeah. how, do you, how do you do that? How, how do does you, a human do that? Right. And the, the answer is that there is no answer, once again. And this is the thing that everybody hates, and this is what I love about it so much, because it makes us question these very important things that we all take for granted. Humans have an amazing inclination to just be enamored with our own ideas and to just reaffirm our own convictions. And something like this just forces us out of our comfort zone, makes us ask yeah. these really tough questions. Yeah. How do you give a, a machine, a robot, morals you can't do that right i mean you have to you have to give them every possible angle it's a very difficult question and yeah. just, i'm gonna 
start off with an example of perhaps why, and then yeah. talk about just a potential resolution, which is obviously not an answer. There's no one, but I'm just going to give a, a stab at it. All right. So, for example, one of the biggest handicaps that we've been facing in the self-driving car things is that the cars are good. They're too good, in fact. The uh, uh, Many of the accidents that have been taking places with self-driving cars mm -hmm. are just slow-speed rear-end fender benders. Why do you think that is? Because the self-driving cars don't break the law. And so they don't speed, right. while humans, on the other hand, do. And so the self-driving car is forced to make a decision. I need to merge onto this interstate, but all the cars are flying by me at 75, and I'm not going to go faster than 65. How do I do it safely? And many times, it can't. And so there, is the, there are these big issues that it's faced with, is how do you deal with, as soon as you tell the car, well, the only way to navigate that safely is to break the law. Right. Mm. Where does that stop? Right. Right? So, so there yeah. it is. You got to ask yourself. To really understand when it's okay is you have to decide when it's okay to break the law. So an analogy that I like to give for this is uh, something that, again, a lot of people aren't, aren't really a fan of, but laws are <clears throat> more like guidelines, right? It's not something that we should follow for the sake of the law. It's more like, here's a description of the shared values and the shared fiction of the people that I have chosen to voluntarily live with. So if I'm going to live with these people, I have a responsibility to respect the shared value system of these people. That being said, it's just a suggestion. I'm not going to stop at a stop sign if I'm being chased by zombies, right? right. It's not like this hard and fast law that you just absolutely cannot break. Right. So what you, what you would want to say is how do we teach AI morals? You give it the same value system as the average people in your society because that is what we've defined in general as what's right, or, right and wrong. Right. Yeah, you can see the problems with that right away, right? Is there's a lot of For people sure. who have some convictions about certain myths or because not myths. As soon are, as a self-driving car runs over an old lady, they're gonna try to say, "No more self-driving cars. We gotta regular. We gotta ban the self-driving cars. They're killing old ladies now." But a human would have done the same thing potentially. Or you look at the statistics and you find that humans are killing far more people than self-driving right. cars are. Right. Right. On uh, on average, like you know, per the volume. I mean, obviously, for sure, there's far more people driving than cars. So right. you don't want to look at that statistic. You want to yeah. look at the percentage of cars that are actually hitting. Uh, people and self-driving cars so far have been phenomenal. They're too good is the problem. So we have to somehow teach them to be worse, to be better. Teach them to break the law, right? Just like we do. Yeah. Just like we do. Te teach them to be as uh, as broken as we are. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. That's, that's, it's that's crazy how far insane. that stuff's come. Indeed. Have you, do you have one of those cars? No, no, I don't. Not yet. Once it gets a little more mainstream. You want one though? Do I want one? I don't know. I like motorcycles. Oh, yeah, motorcycle Ooh, yeah me too. I want to get a motorcycle. Yeah. I've been saving up for a motorcycle. What do you got? I have a 2015 Yamaha FZ07. Oh, okay. Wow. I'm like looking like Harley One of those style. fast bikes. Yeah, it's got like one of those, those uh, yellow candied rims. Oh, yeah. I don't know why I bought it. It's really not my <laughs> style. I'm oftentimes more conservative, but maybe I was having <laughs> a midlife crisis. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Pull up to the campus on your, uh, on your Honda. I like it. Ring, ring, ring. Popping wheelies. Popping a wheelie through oh, the parking man. lot. I can see yeah. it. Yeah. Professor Croc is here, yeah. <laughs> bitches. I remember back in, in high school, I had, a, I had a 1987 Corvette Coupe. Uh, really? I was at Seminole High School, and yeah. uh, there was, oh, God, the good old days, man. You remember the intersection where there's the gas station right across from the parking lot? That little yeah. intersection Circle right there? Circle K. Yeah, yeah, of course, yep. everybody knows. You got to go to the Circle K after mm -hmm. school. Always. Um, yeah, I pulled out there, you know, because everybody from school is, like, at that intersection or at Circle K or at the corner. So right. that's where just that's where life happens. Like, yeah, you want to be yeah. noticed, you got to be there. Right there. So I was like, hey, I'm going to be noticed. And so I rolled down my window, started blaring, what was it, uh, give me fuel, give me fire, give me that one. Metallica. I started doing some donuts in the middle of, an, of the intersection. Oh, uh, yes. Just, like, such a hoople head. I don't know what I was thinking, man. But I was adrenaline, it. you're young, living life. I, I got a reckless driving ticket, so you did from yeah. that. Yeah, that pay that, that didn't work out so oh, well. Man. <laughs> wow, I got what I deserved, of course, but it was still a good memory. Honestly, I'd probably still do it again. That's, yeah, that's what yeah. I mean. Awesome. You got to break the law sometimes and live life a little you bit. You got hell to. Yeah, the self sure. driver car would have never did that. <laughs> no, hell no. Would have never had turn the volume fun. down. Yeah. Play Ed Sheeran. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, man, that's yeah. incredible. What about have you have you uh, dabbled in like video games, like virtual reality, and and like 
simulated reality, any, anything like that? Or Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. So uh, the lab that I work in at Florida State University mm -hmm. uh, used to be called the Visualization Laboratory. Uh -huh. uh, it's run by Dr. It was run by uh, Gordon or Dr. Gordon Erlebacher, who is my advisor. He's the chairman of the Department of Scientific Computing. Okay. And he teaches the Introduction to Game and Simulator Design course. Wow. So in the visualization lab, we have all kinds of tools. We got the Oculus Rift, we got the HoloLens, we got the the Neuron, the mobile trackers. We got we got all kinds of good stuff. Wow. Yeah. Have you ever played Fortnite? Fortnite. Uh, no, but I watched your podcast with one of the world's best for Fortnite players. Yeah, oh, yeah. Tifu. Yeah, his name. How is cool is that? He's a local yeah. kid. No way. From right here yeah. on Indian Rose Beach. How outlandish is that? He's a Crazy. local kid, seventeen-year-old millionaire. <laughs> wow. Playing video, video games. games. <laughs> Yeah, it's incredible. Short. It's, in, it's insane, man. That's a that's that's what we were talking about that's earlier. You be a Renaissance man, or you get extremely fucking good at at something at something like that, and and all those different paths are neither is more right, right or wrong than the other. It's just right. a different life that kind of sadly for me, I'm often sort of met with <laughs> sadness at really? all the facets of life that I'm just never going to experience. Right? Yeah. Like I'm never going to be a guy who just like surfs on the beaches of Hawaii. I won't know like the emotional psychological phenomena that sort of overcomes you when that's, that's who you are. And I'm never gonna be a devout religious person who goes and just preaches what he believes in 100%. I mean, there's so much life that I'm just never gonna get to experience. And when you think of that, it's kind of sad sometimes. Why won't you get to experience it? You could go surf in Hawaii. <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, what I mean is like a lifetime of that. I, if I go do it- A for, lifetime of it. Yeah, so for, I mean, so for example, have you traveled before? Of course. Yeah. I mean, to international yeah. or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. You go and you meet these people and you see what it's like and it's cool and all. Right. right. And you come back and you're like, oh my God, that was the best thing yeah, ever. Yeah, but we really have no idea. Right. We have such a short, ex and this is where machine learning comes in again, right? We have a short exposure to information and that allows us to create a very ill informed, what we call prior opinion about what it's actually like. Because mm -hmm. we're trying to take this information and reconcile it with our worldview that we learned over here with our Western values. And so we're taking what we think they're experiencing and fitting it into what we understand life to be. But if you were over there and you were raised there, you would see life so much differently. It's just, it's very hard to, to describe. I mean, the epitome of it is, is when you think about, in a religions, right? We, we all have, all humans come from the same cast, 99.98 something percent similar DNA. Yet, just in the right environment, the right circumstances, and the right exposure, you can be raised to be, you know, Buddhist, Catholic, Jew, you know, Jewish, well, all these different religions that are just exposed to you from a very young age, and it just totally changes your worldview. Yeah. So there's just infinitely many lives that we're never going to be able to experience. This is what we've got, and we just make the best of it. But right. sometimes it's sad to just think about what we'll never see. But do you think we live different lives, like in different dimensions, like... What do you, are you a religious are person? We in a, are we in a simulation? <laughs> you know, interestingly, the answer to both of those questions is the same. Um, there does not exist uh, enough evidence either way to actually make a concrete decision. Right. We have to do what most people do, which is what we have to do as a human, and that's just choose to believe based on what's consistent with our values and what we've been taught and what we've been exposed to. Right. So are we in a simulation? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, life would be the same whether we were or whether we weren't interestingly. Um, and am I, am I religious? Uh, I don't think I'm religious. I'd say that I don't really have enough evidence either way. <clears throat> yeah. um, you know, some people are, are like devout atheists. I think it's oftentimes, you know, maybe as uh, dangerous to say that there is no God as it is to say that there is one because right. nobody can actually prove it either way. They just right. choose to believe it because it's consistent with their values and their worldview. Right. And you, I mean, do you often th overthink to the point where you are like, wow, I sh like you were saying before, you're like, I wish I could have, you know, spend my life surfing on the beaches of Hawaii or, or climbing Machu Picchu or doing this and mm -hmm. that. I mean, instead of having like that versus like having like the narrow minded, like the narrow tunnel vision of just going down one path and sticking to it, like similar to like the video game kid yeah. who obviously never tried to do anything, do anything else. Maybe he thought about it, but just stuck down one path from when you were a young kid to when you got older, mm -hmm. got lucky, hit the jackpot. People say, oh, that kid's so lucky or whatever. But like someone like you, who was blessed and cursed to be so freaking smart <laughs> that you think about all these different scenarios that you could have done. Is that, does that make you kind of like, is that what you said? It makes you sad? Does it's, that make you sad? Sometimes, sometimes. But, you know, as I said a little earlier, I try to be consistent with this worldview. And that is that 
It's neither right nor wrong. I don't regret it. This is my choice. That was his choice. If I would have lived a life like, well, choice. So we don't really have too much of a choice. We're just sort of born where we're born. Yeah. And then we like to have pride in that as if we somehow had choice over our nation of birth or something like that. But, yeah. you know, we, uh, we live the life we live and we make the best of it. You acknowledge yeah. the lives of others. Try and internalize it as much as you can. See their worldview. But... We can't unless I finish my invention and make that mind machine where we can put experiences in different people's minds. <laughs> I think there's an episode of Black Mirror that's like that. Yeah, yeah. Have there you for seen sure it? is. Have, have you, you seen watched Black that Mirror? show? I've seen some of it. Yeah. Where so they have that? like a little chip or something, right? And you could see people's like yeah. memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's, there's also one in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. They got that gun at the end, remember? I, I think that was that. the answer to the secret of life or something like that. And it was just Hitchhiker's shooting. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah, I you remember that, that movie, up. but I don't remember with the with the raccoon and shit. No, no, that's uh, uh, Guardians. That's Guardians, Guardians of the, of the Galaxy. Oh, what was Great that movie, one? By the way, it's yeah, that's what I was thinking. I never <laughs> <saw that> one. <laughs> what was the other one called? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, and then at the very end, there's the the gun. I don't remember what it's called, but they, they make a joke out of it. But basically, it's like now men know what women are thinking because you know the woman oh. shoots you, and then suddenly you know what she's thinking. It's sort of uh, is that sort of how your invention will work? You know, I thought a lot about it, and it's. There's a lot of like really dangerous pitfalls to go into, and you know not only just philosoph philosophical, but also you know physiological, like the neuroscience behind it. You know, as I started studying neuroscience over the years, I worked at the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience for many years and learned a lot about how all this stuff works. And it's just we are so incredibly far away from something like that. Really? Yeah. Would it be more of a gun, or would it be more of like a like a like a <laughs> electric chair you sit in and like a thing goes over your head and you strap into it? What would it, what would it look like in your mind? Yeah, I mean, and when I dreamed it up in my nonsensical, uh, you know, uh, idea stew, um, it would be something akin to, like, a headset that uses something like, you know, uh, magnetic fields to stimulate certain okay. regions and certain neural pathways. But the problem is the following, is that every human being can be presented with the exact same stimulus, theoretically, which they can't, right, because just different angles and everything, but just theoretically they're presented with the exact same stimulus, and they'll represent that stimulus internally in completely different ways, All right? So the idea of me somehow mapping the experience that you had, learning mm -hmm. it, and then somehow making someone else experience it, yeah. I would have to know their entire mapping of their brain and somehow which neural pathways and right. you know, spatiotemporal patterns represented different feelings and experiences and activate them in some crazy order. I mean, it's, a, it's really just a fairy tale right now, but you know, you gotta dream about this stuff sometimes to yeah. work towards the, the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was going to say that. <laughs> it's crazy. It's so deep. <laughs> My mind is being blown every, like, 15 seconds. Yeah. And I'm trying to follow along. To people want to try to figure out how to live longer and live forever. Yeah. Right? The, so the I'm sure there's people out there researching and all that stuff, and I can only imagine how far it's really gone already. You know, Do you think that we're that we far out about. from something like that? Well, there's, uh, there's, I guess, two main approaches to something like that, you know, at least from what people like to talk about. One is the notion of just, like, putting your brain into something else. Um, and that's only a good idea in the short term because the brain is still biological and physiological, and that will decay over time as well. So it's not like True. you can just keep putting your brain into a new body. And the, the right, because your brain's the brain old. It's just, it's, right, it's a, the brain is a hunk of meat also, right? Yeah, it's going to die just like everything else, right? Um, and where are we? How far away, away from that? Uh, I think very recently there was this very controversial research that, uh, or uh, operation that somebody's been trying to take place where they're going to transplant one guy's head onto another body. Oh, yeah. I, I heard about that. Yeah, I, I don't like think it has happened yet, and I don't really know how much truth there is behind something like that, but that would be an example of where you're not necessarily putting somebody's brain into another body, but you're putting someone's head onto another body, and so... I, I really don't know anything about medicine, so I can't speculate on that. But yeah. you know, you just wanted to know how reasonable it is. It that's you know that's where that's at. But the other option is uploading the brain into a dig digital medium, right. where it should right. allegedly persist well beyond the the constraints of the, you know the biological system. Um, then there's no there's no meat carcass that you have to deal with. It's just digital, right? Yes, yes. Well, uh, well described. Um, <laughs> that meat bag. Is that yeah. What? Was that what they call it? I don't know. The meat bags that we're trapped <laughs> yeah, in yeah. for our whole lives. Yeah, uh, we're incredibly far away from anything like that even being remotely possible. Really? So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what we can do is measure some patterns and neural pathways and then like make some you know very very weak predictions about what somebody's thinking or doing before they do it based off of you know patterns that are taking place. Mm -hmm. For example, there was another experiment where 
they had two, uh, I don't know if I'm going to cite this correctly, but they had two uh, mice or rats, hamsters, something like that, on, on uh, very far away from one another, opposite sides of the planet for all I know. And um, there, there was a, uh, an electrode in the brain of one, and it was navigating a maze. And while it was navigating the maze, it was sending the signals that it was experiencing in its brain to the other uh, mouse, rat, hamster, right. wherever it was. But that one was not traveling through the maze. And the goal was to find some cheese. So the first one, you know, got stuck, and then eventually it found some cheese. And then they just let the other one loose in the exact same maze, just duplicated, and it went straight to the cheese. So there is so something. So he didn't hit any of the roadblocks along the way. Because he, he learned the, ma- the, the route right. based off knew. of the neural um, uh, activity that was going on in his counterpart. Yeah. Right. So how, what, that's something they implant into these rats? What, how does that work? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I mean, so the fundamental premise of all this is that you're measuring neural activity, right? So you have a, what's called an electrode that gets very close to a soma, a cell body. Sometimes it punctures it. Uh, maybe it's in you know the axon or the dendrite, just some part of the neuron itself. And then as that neuron activates, this electrode measures the voltage changes that's taking is, place. This is something physical, like you could touch. When you say the electrode, they put it, it's something like... Yep. Physical yes, that exactly. they put in there. Okay. Exactly. They shoot like a syringe in there into their head or something, or what, what is it, like a microchip? <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes, I mean, it, there's a lot of different techniques, but okay. the general premise is always the following get access to the brain, yeah. stick a needle in it. Okay. And so, I mean, whether that needle punctures the cell or it's just right next to it and measuring small voltage fluctuations, you know, just near the, the periphery of the cell body, or whether it's actually inside the cell body, mm-hmm. all modifies the results. You, know, you have to clean up and denoise that stuff. But that's the idea of recording the activity of one brain. And then the idea of then sort of imposing that on the brain of another, I don't know the science behind how that was done. So I'll. Do they, do they take it out of the first? whatever, the rat or whatever it is, and put it in the next one? Or they, they just have record one? It. They just record it, right? So every okay. time the neuron fires... And then they just upload, or just digitally... It's just digitally, so it's basically an electrical current. They're just right. measuring voltage changes. And so then, each one has one, and yeah, it transfers to not it. Not all the neurons, obviously. That'd be an impossible. There's yeah. yeah, way too many neurons. There's more neurons in the brain than there are, I don't know, trees in one of the largest forests in the world, right? I mean, it's, it's absurd. Um, <laughs> But you That's fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy to think about. It's it's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. It's exciting. It's, yeah, fast, see, it's I'm, fascinating to me. I'm it's torn, insane. man. I mean, I get excited about it sometimes, but yeah. then I can empathize with the fears, and I don't feel like yeah. either way is right or wrong. And I right. think we would be better off sort of embracing both and finding a compromise that right. you know, finds the best for everyone. But what do I know? What do you think about, like, like plasticity? Is plasticity, does that, does that mean that you can basically retrain your brain to do things that it was like opposite of what it was originally trained to do. Like when you were developed as a young kid, like when your brain develops, when you're young and you learn, like you were said, like you have certain pathways in your brain and you have a certain map of the way you see and the way you take, take in input, right? Is plasticity, does that, does that mean that you're able to change that stuff? Like for instance, you're able to change the way that you inter- interact with all the elements and all, everything in the world. Like, Explain that to me. Like I, I, I exactly never really what understood what, what it was. Okay, I was right. Yeah, you nailed it right on the butt, okay. man. You, you missed your calling as a neuroscientist. Okay. You know? Damn, you're I knew, a genius. I knew, I knew I had something. I knew I had something in me when I met you in high school. <laughs> there it is, man. So, uh, plus, uh, now you're talking my language. Like this is sort of the core of uh, my research that that I'm working on, and this revolves around the concept of representation learning, right? Okay. So, uh, the very first thing that happens, as I said, is that information needs to be ingested. You know, you get some electromagnetic wave of a photon, it hits, uh, you know, a, a cell, a, a photoreceptive cell in the back of your retina. That wave gets transduced into electrical signal, which then passes through some other cells and then goes to the optical nerve to the back of the brain. Okay, so how does this wave get represented internally? Like, what's going on with that? Well, the idea of behind plasticity is that you have one neuron, this is the soma, the cell body, you have what's called the axon, which is where it sends signals down the, down the line, and you have what is called the dendrites, where it aggregates all the information from everything that it's listening to. So what plasticity says is that one of the dendrites, for example, if it is listening to activity from another neuron, say from this you know, electromagnetic wave that it just received, that it just experienced, the, the, the strength between these two is able to change. Right? And so what does that mean, and how is that useful? Well, what that means is that as we start seeing sensory information over and over and over again, 
internally in the brain, our ability to process it starts getting accustomed to right. that sensory input. And we start recognizing that sensory input. And we start finding patterns in that sensory input. And this is one of Anticipating it, right? Anticipating it, exactly. This is one of the key observations behind, you know, one of the deepest parts of machine learning, in my opinion, uh, which is representation learning. And so here's the example for that. Let's say that I showed you a bicycle. And I said, Danny, what is this thing? What would you say? It's a thing you sit on and you do wheelies on. There you go. <laughs> get, from, get, your, get to school on it. There you go. You might say it's a bicycle. Right. And then I would go, how do you know it's a bicycle? And then you'd say? Because it has two wheels and handlebars. Well, a motorcycle has two wheels and handlebars. And a motor, so it's a motor bicycle. Oh, there you go. All right, so the, the idea is, though, is that we can keep asking these questions and they get more and more refined as to why do we call this thing what it is. Start with maybe a, a coffee mug. Here's another example. Okay. What is this? It's a coffee mug. Right. How do you know? Well, it has a handle. Well, so does a beer mug. Right. Uh, well, it's short. Okay, well, so is a teacup. Oh, well, you just keep asking these questions. And right. it turns out that there are these very, very, very subtle features of things that allow us to distinguish and disambiguate between them. And so the question is, how do we represent those features internally? And that's an active area of research, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. I have a hypothesis that it revolves around some of the fundamental concepts, old neuroscience that's sort of been forgotten in modern day research, which is called Hebbian plasticity. And so we can show that locally, all these individual neurons that are making these local- he Hebbian? Hebbian, yeah. Hebbian plasticity. Okay. Donald Hebb. Okay, he's Hebb. the guy. He's, he's the guy who did it, okay. Yeah, he's like, hey, neurons that fire together, wire together. That's, that's his, me, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's his big catchphrase. And okay. so we call it Hebbian plasticity. Okay. And uh, yeah, so the idea is that all of these neurons locally start changing their behavior completely ignorant of everything else that's going on around them. And somehow, uh, which is what I'm trying to show in my research, we get a larger aggregate order that arises from this local activity. And the example that I like to give to this is uh, humans. We all just exist on our own and we're all independent and selfish and we make decisions on our own self-interest. Yet somehow we have these magnificent shared fictions like corporations and religions and governments and nations. And we just create these amazing concepts all from our just individual needs a spontaneous order that arises chaotically it's very beautiful and um, we see this in nature all of the time and uh, i contend that uh the brain does the same thing yeah Delving i'm gonna have to rewatch this like 10 15 <laughs> times over to catch oh, that's everything that's not good yeah you gotta i need to learn to say it uh, more clearly so if i say something that's not clear you you know give me a hard time about it because it's my job no it's not educator. you it's just so many different words that are not normally in my vocabulary and that's my fault right so i need stuff to that use... i listen to every day but no, I need Danny's to on that's not your fault you're accustomed to it he's not it's a, it's the plasticity <laughs> but i like it because i'm learning i'm definitely learning picking up little gems along the way for sure <laughs> well I, I gotta go on a little diatribe now that you just mentioned that but you know when you were saying i'm using a bunch of little terms that you don't understand and it's your fault here's the reality right is that Communication is another one of these spontaneous order things, and it is just fascinating. Like, let's just take a moment and just appreciate the majesty of communication, okay? Internally, in this just massive net of, you know, so many neurons, um, I have some concept or some idea somehow, mysteriously. Right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to somehow turn this signal into a pattern of neural activity that oscillates the vocal cords in my throat that's going to make slight little pressure changes in the molecules in the air. These are then going to travel to you and move little hairs in your ears, which is then going to create a neural signal which goes to a certain part in the brain where you then interpret the language and then somehow put all these words together and represent that idea. So I'm literally taking some crazy idea in my brain, transducing it into just waves through the air and then recreating it in your brain. Like, that's just phenomenal, right? But which makes me do the same thing, create things that go on my face, which project back into your eyeballs and make you feel a different kind of way. And it just goes back and forth, right? Dude, that's, you, you hit on a very important thing, and that's feedback during communication. Feedback, right. Some people, uh, there's a lot of psychological disorders where they just don't have that capacity, mm -hmm. where they just like talk and they aren't even aware of what people are, or, or how they're interpreting what they say. But to what you said, right? Think about how much, you know, just sheer majesty goes into the ability of me to communicate some idea to you, right? The fact that I'm taking the effort to do that means 
that I'm trying to put my idea from my brain into yours, if I, which means I have the responsibility to choose all of the words and to communicate the idea from your prior and your perspective as best as possible. Right. It's just foolish of me to just speak in my own <laughs> world in my own little vacuum chamber and expect <laughs> you to understand me, right? So I have a responsibility to communicate as effectively and carefully as possible. Otherwise, why am I even talking? I just want to hear myself talk. That's not some. That's not someone I <laughs> no, want to I meet. Think so. you're a lot of people like to. I know a few people who like to do that. Yeah, unfortunately. Ben, <laughs> on <the> normal <laughs> podcast episodes. No, yeah. I think you're nailing it pretty good. I mean, you got to keep it on a certain level, but it's just my brain's working at super fast speeds right now to retain all this information. <laughs> <laughs> he's a four cylinder. He's, yeah, I'm running right on, on four. fumes right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, man. There's like there's a guy that that we do a show. I do a show with on on our YouTube channel, right? Mm-hmm. He's a um, he's a real estate dude. He's big fat. New York Jew, <laughs> and mm-hmm. he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. One of the richest dudes I've ever met, and wow. you consider him really fucking successful, right? Sure. I follow. I've followed him around for the past six years, documenting you know here and there what he does, making little vignettes and putting them on YouTube, and people fucking love it. People just go crazy over it. They're they fascinated this with it. Yeah. This big, and he is no offense to Ben if you're watching this. <laughs> He'll never watch it. He, he never watches any most, of our videos. If. He is literally. Not, not that ignorance is a bad thing. I don't think ignorance is a bad thing. But he is the most, one of the most ignorant, narrow-minded motherfuckers I've ever met. But he's yeah. so fucking rich and successful at, the, just, at, at real estate. Yeah. And, and people think that his opinions are so... They, they put his opinions so high above everybody else just because of that one fact that he's because so of successful success. in real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of interesting things that you brought up there. I mean, the first one is something that I'm, I'm rather passionate about uh, trying to oppose, and that's the, the far too commonly um, uh, committed fallacy, which is the appeal to authority. So yeah. as you said, so many people just respect what he says as if he, as some th- sort of an authority figure, mm-hmm. knows right. what's right and what's wrong. Right. And that's one of the lowest forms of reasoning, right? I mean, there's, there's no real internal judgment that's being made. They're not really reconciling his information with their own internal model. They're just like taking it as, as, as truth. Um, and far too many humans, um, in my opinion, do that. And I think we as a society would... Um, benefit if more people took a bit more responsibility and discipline for what they consider to be uh, true or not true. Right. And uh, the other thing that's really interesting is, yeah, he's a big, obnoxious kind of guy. And honestly, that's great. And the reason is, is because we need all kinds. Mm-hmm. The whole right. world needs all kinds. And there's one thing that you know, we've learned in science, and that's the vast majority of things on average behave what we behave as, as what we call like a Gaussian distribution. And it basically just looks like a little bell. And what that means is the majority of people are right here in the middle, and it's high because that's where all the people are. And as you taper off to the other ends, there's fewer and fewer people out there. But if those people weren't there, this thing wouldn't be a Gaussian, and it would start to become very, very narrow, and it would start to become very, very uh, pointy, and everybody would be all the same. The same, yeah. And the problem when everybody's the same is that people can't change. Right. And so we intrinsically need people like that to adapt right. and grow. And, and I think as long as we have a tolerant mindset, as we said before, nobody's right or wrong. We observe, reconcile with our world model and make the best of it, you know? So it sounds like an interesting guy and I'd probably enjoy checking him out. Yeah, check him out. Oh, yeah, dude. man, we should have had him out here tonight. It's an interesting thing. Like, like we were talking about before, though, the communication part of it. Like he, the guy's a really good communicator and, yeah. and, and being able to <clears throat> being able to you know, influence people and make them think a certain way, even though it may not be true. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. So at first you said he's very brash and he says what he wants and that people just listen to him because of his, uh, his power and his money. Right. Does he actually observe who he's communicating to and communicate in a way effective for them to understand? Or does he just use his platform and his power to convince people? He definitely conforms to who he's communicating to. Then indeed he sounds like a very good communicator. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, it's yeah it just blows my mind i mean it's a lot it's a very similar to how like donald trump can communicate to people how he can communicate to all the people who voted for him you know sure. he knows how to communicate to his audience you know what i mean to get what he wants all right and and this guy can do the same thing you know depending on who he's talking to like like he can be whoever he wants whatever he wants just sounds by. like a uh 
uh, an edge case sociopath, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. yeah. And it's to get what he wants, you know. Yeah. I mean, whether it's mm-hmm. buying a car or a house, he's going to talk to that person. And he's going to get that. He's going to get what he wants for the price that he wants. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's when all he goes to get a car, he's going to beat result. the guy up, and the guy's not going to want to sell it for <laughs> price. But at the end of the beating, the ear beating this guy <laughs> receives, he will get the car at the price <laughs> he wants it. It's That's interesting. An interesting life. That's interesting. Social media too, man. Like the communication through social media, uh, people can. People can see something and, and take it their own way and put their own put their own story behind it and it makes them feel a certain kind of way and it may not be the truth. Yeah. Um, like we were talking about right before right before we started recording. Yeah, we were talking about that a little bit earlier about social media and the comments and, and yeah, what did you say yeah. you did with that? Yeah, so it's it's pretty um, it's, it's pretty devastating to our social structure and and our ability to communicate with one another. Um, in a lot of ways. It also has many strengths, as everything does. To unilaterally label anything as good or bad is often uh, evidence that somebody doesn't really know exactly what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. But um, from the perspective of you know listening to individuals and respecting them, um, it's a pretty terrible medium, and it's causing a lot of problems. And the reason is um, it's, it's pretty simple. Well, nothing's really simple, if you look at it the right <laughs> way. Um, but it's because there's no repercussions for their actions. And it really comes down to what you were saying before. Um, when I say something to you, I see your face and I get feedback from what I right. say. And that tempers what I'm going to say and modifies the next words that I'm going to choose, et cetera. Like that communication medium that we have from face-to-face interaction right. is very, very, very different than me just having my own self-righteous thoughts and just stomp, you know, slamming my hands around like a monkey trying to right. just vomit my, my half-thought ideas, right? Right, right. So um, it's teaching us very bad communication skills. You know, as I demonstrated earlier, I'm kind of perhaps uh, illogically enamored with the notion of communication. And, you know, the social media is not really... Um, at least in the human level, not a very good um, medium for us to communicate. But again, there's all kinds of other very interesting things that it's enabled us to do. For example, we have been able to observe trends in data based off of certain people from certain regions, and they say certain things. Yeah, maybe they're saying completely, you know, uh, angry, aggressive vitriol, and they're just like spewing stuff. But we can still find passions and truths and opinions, and we can look at these all globally, locally, regionally, and we can start understanding better uh, a lot of the social problems that we've been facing. You know, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of issues with gender and race, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And we can explore these a lot better with the medium of social uh, social media. So uh, it's, it's got to strengthen its weaknesses, of course, as everything does. Yeah. I mean, the commenters on these videos that are, can, be, can be pretty brutal. These people are pretty yeah. ruthless. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think in the long run, that usually just looks wor- looks bad on them. But, I mean, the yeah. reality is, I mean, maybe 10 people read their comments and then right. Right. nobody cares anymore because everybody right. knows there's just no real there's no real information or knowledge in the comments nowadays. Right. And so if those of you who are thinking about just writing nonsense, please take <laughs> a little more responsibility in your in your in communicating your ideas. Yeah. For real. I mean, it's, it's getting hot in here. Yeah, let me turn, let me turn, <laughs> I'm turn What I happened th- to that? I, th- I, th- I think th- Forrest th- is th- digitally th- turning th- the AC up because I see, keep seeing it come on and it goes up like one degree, one degree. And I think he's at home watching us turning the AC up. I'll turn the heat on us. <laughs> so he's pranking us, huh? I think so. I keep seeing that thing pop up and get hotter. I like him. <laughs> yeah, he's funny. He, he got really, really butt hurt. He was on one of the first pot, uh, not one of the first, but he was a few podcasts ago. He was, he was talking to uh, a buddy, Jack, a friend of mine who um, was, he was very active on YouTube about trying to educate people on, like, the red tide going on in Florida. Mm. Like, basically, he was being very vocal and talking a lot about, like, the politics behind the people that were responsible for creating the cause and effect of red tide with, like, the sugar cane, the sugar cane fields and all the... um, you know, all the toxins and all, all of the uh, pesticides going into Lake Okeechobee and causing the red tide. Then we started getting into like eating and dieting and forest is like, he doesn't know anything about that. And forest right. would be like, why, why, when I go to McDonald's the and eat veganism a, and, you know what I mean? and he's like, well, you got to eat healthy, you know, the Jack, and he's like, you got to eat healthy. You got to care about the environment. And forest is, you know, he's like, well, why? I could, it's cheaper to I buy can, a dollar I can buy cheeseburger. A double cheeseburger for a dollar and save money, and that makes me happy. Yeah. And then people on the comments were just basically crucifying oh, yeah. Forrest. And it, they went it, on him hard. He won't come that. on the podcast anymore. Thanks, guys. <laughs> well, that's unfortunate. And I'll be honest, I think. 
that's one of the problems with social media is people get very, very passionate about their ideas, as I shared before. I mean, humans right. have this incredible inclination. We just love our own ideas. Yeah. And especially from the safety of our own laptop in our home, right? We of course. Are, yeah. We are the authority of all that is knowledge, right? right? No consequences. But the reality is, is that force isn't, isn't entirely wrong. Right. And, and the problem is, is that here's, here's a great example. Um, that I'm, I'm a fan, it's a, I don't remember his name, there's a great economist who, who writes about this stuff all the time. And here's the example. So let's say that there's a park, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful park, and people like to walk through it. Okay, so right now our society has this very large leaning towards preserving society, or I'm sorry, preserving nature and parks and, and the environment. So we all have a, a, a very strong bias towards environmentalism. Okay, okay. but now let's say... Somebody else comes along and he says, actually, you know what? I'd like to knock down this park and put a parking garage on here so that I can park my car. Right. And then we go, Phew. well, we have a decision to make here. We have somebody who wants to take down the park and put a parking garage and somebody who wants to just enjoy the beauty of nature and walk through the park. And here's the problem is once again, as we talked about earlier, there's no, there's no notion of like an intrinsic right or wrong. And so the problem is, is that oftentimes people from that environmental perspective feel as though they have like a moral high ground where they say, right. no, preserving nature is the right thing to do. But you ask why? Why is it the right thing to do? You just choose that it's the right thing to do because it makes you feel good. Well, I wanna save the earth, but why? Well, because it's fulfilling. Well, the reality is the following. This person's desire to take down the park and put a parking garage is equally as valid as the individual who wants to preserve the parking or who wants to preserve the park. And so here's where the, the, the real truth comes from is the person who wants to preserve the park says, well, you can't take down the park because that is irreversible. Once you take it down, you can never get it back. And they're true. They're right there. And there's a lot of truth behind that. However, they overlook the fact that there's something else that is equally irreversible. And that is time. Every single day that this person does not get to build their parking garage, they're going to have a day of convenience taken away from them. We have this sort of internal desire to say, oh, well, you want convenience over me wanting to save the earth, so you're wrong and I'm right. And there's no reason for that. That's just an opinion, once again. When the right philosophy would be the following, both people are equally right. So what we should do is build some environmentally sustainable parking garage or something that satisfies everybody instead of just being polarized and bickering coming from some moral right. high ground. We just realize that everyone's right and try and find a, a medium that satisfies everyone's desires. It's very easy right. when you look at it from that perspective at least. But wouldn't you say that the person that wanted the park is trying to look out for the earth? That's, that's in everyone's that's in everybody's interest, right? Because everyone mm -hmm. lives on the earth and we want the earth to last longer and we all want to live longer, right? Isn't that something that's a common value? Everyone wants to live longer and everyone wants the earth to be around. Or maybe are you arguing that this person doesn't care about the earth as far as their life? Yeah, I would argue two I mean, things. There's, it's complicated. Yeah, there's, there's two things. I mean, one, the notion of self-preservation is, once again, just an int intrinsic desire. It isn't right or wrong. As I said before, if somebody wants <laughs> environmentalism, it turns out that saving the earth is, uh, is best done by killing everybody. Well, where do you draw the line? Right. right? So True. Right? So, I mean, it, it, you, you bring up a good point. I mean, it is pretty complicated, but... I think that as long as we're able to find a happy medium where everybody is cognizant of the desires and wants of everyone else, and as long as we yeah. realize that deep down, whatever we think or we feel is not intrinsically right or wrong, it just builds us up to be naturally tolerant of others. And I, I like to, so I'm going to reemphasize the, the significance of that with just an example. Okay. The difference between being sort of objectively, uh, subjectively opinionated, you know, based on what you think and feel versus objectively opinionated, which is complete right and wrong, is the difference between 99% and 100%. Well, what does that mean? That's a small little pedantic detail, Nathan. No, it's not. The difference between 99% and 100% is the difference between somebody being very passionate about a religion and trying to share it with others, but having conversations, and then being an extremist who no longer needs to have discussions because they have the truth. It's 100%. Right. Their only responsibility now is to just pound the truth into the rest of the world because there is no room for being wrong. That's the very thin line that creates a very dangerous uh, society, uh, um, situation in society. So, right. And that even shows itself in this notion of just environmentalism wanting a parking garage or not. As soon as one person is convinced that they're right, they're already wrong. And I, a lot of people, I think, could benefit from just realizing how little we actually know and how absolute our, own convic our convictions really are. I bet you get into some serious. Have you gotten like to into, into a serious political debate with like a family member or a friend? When I was younger, yeah, I was not, much less not tolerant. Not recently. 
No, I mean, because again, you just, you just avoid them. I mean, you got No, gotta, not at all. I, I welcome that, it. That would be like sport for you, I feel like. No, I welcome it. And the reason is, is because I see it as an opportunity to champion what, I, what I'm so excited and passionate about as right. tolerance and listening to them and accepting them as being different, but sharing an equally valid alternative view. And as the more people we have doing that, the better our situation is going to become. I mean, we are more polarized now than we've ever been, halfly to blame for social media, by the way. Um, and I think what we really need is just people to realize how little we actually know. There's this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect. You guys might have heard of it. It's a psychological mm -hmm. phenomenon that says the less people know, the more they think they know. And, uh, right. you know, we're plagued with that via social media. The less people know, I mean, they, they go ahead and they, they, they Google one or two websites. I mean, I fall and pray to this too. We all do, right? Where I read one or two things and I'm like, oh, I see. So this is how it is. So right. no, you're not right because this thing said this thing, which said this thing and we're just perpetuating the problem. When the reality is, is the more that you know, the more you know you don't know. And I find that right. when I'm around like academics who dedicate their life to mastering something, they're just incredibly humble about their knowledge because they see how much they don't know. Right. You know, and when somebody doesn't know how much they don't know, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. They, they can't measure okay. their own incompetence. <laughs> right. All right, so they're stuck here thinking they know a lot because they don't know enough to know that they don't know a lot. It's a very curious uh, <laughs> phenomenon. Yeah. No, no, I've, I'm definitely familiar with that. I didn't know the actual name of it, but n yeah. you know, knowing that you don't know a lot is smart or that's that's whatever, whatever the, the word best way is. To learn that's more. the best way to learn more, <laughs> right? To know that you you don't know everything. So you're saying I'm smart because I know less than you guys. But I know that I know less yeah, but, than you. Yeah, but you don't know you don't less, so you you're dumb. What if I us. do? <laughs> There's a great quote. I don't remember the book that it's from, but it's exactly that. You know, this person and I both don't know anything. But I know that I don't know anything. Therefore, I'm smarter than he is. Yeah, there's a, a quote in a book. I can't recall. I'm sure somebody in the internet and in the yeah, they'll find it. Them. Yeah, they'll right. know that one. But yeah, it's it's a great quote, and you're exactly right. Knowing that you don't know is one of the wisest things that that can be done. And what I'm so passionate about is that <clears throat> machine learning and artificial intelligence. Studying that just gives rise to all of these just tolerant ideologies because you start understanding what is intelligence, what is learning, what is memory. Yeah. And we're all just prey to the sensory information that we receive. We make these biased opinions based off of something we can't really control. You understand the learning process, how people make decisions. And I don't know, I just think that's why I'm so excited about uh, us learning more is because I hope that myself and others who know this stuff can come share these things that we've learned from machine learning. And it's my hope that uh, as the message spreads, people might become more tolerant. And maybe before I'm able to invent the machine where we actually truly understand one another, hmm. we can just get a lot closer <clears throat> by being more tolerant and more yeah, understanding of the differences sure. among us. Definitely. Sound like such a hippie, dude. Who do right, you, yeah, who for did real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I felt that, though. Who did you like... Did you have anybody in your life, either now or in your younger years, like when you were, you know, in high school or whatever throughout your life, people that you looked up to that you kind of like tried to model yourself af after? People, influences, like, yeah. who are your biggest influences? This is kind of embarrassing. Um, one of them was Leonardo da Vinci, right? I was very young and just sort of enamored with his notion of absolute knowledge, knowing so many things. So I pursued that. And the other, um, his name is Vash the Stampede. And, uh, yeah. Who's Vash the Stampede? Yeah, oh, he's he's the best man. He's he's who everyone should aspire to be like. Never heard of him. Yeah, should we, we, gotta, we have to look him up here? This, this might be an appropriate look up. Does Vash he have an Instagram? Man. How do you say Vash? Yeah, the, oh, uh, there, he is. there he, he is. He's popular, man. Okay. There he is. Okay. Look at this guy. The anime. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know. I was 12 or 13 years old. And oh, yeah. This, this anime, I mean, I don't know. People like to, again, have very strong priors about things, such as anime yeah. being right or wrong. But um, this one particular anime is, is surprisingly deep. And they explore very, very, very deep, like, philosophical issues. And this was one of those things that made me have this sort of irrational, illogical uh, affinity for just doing good and doing right things. So he's like this super, essentially, he's just this super powerful guy. He has amazing abilities, but all he wants is to just live in peace and be happy. But there's this other guy who wants him to suffer, and so he always tries to do bad things to him, and as a consequence, everyone around him is always getting hurt. And so it's just this whole video about this one, this whole anime series about one guy, just with this heart of gold, just always trying to do good things and help people save the day with his cool powers, but all the while, suffering happens inevitably, and it you know, tackles a lot of the philosophical ideas of, you yeah. know, what's right and what's wrong. How do you feel about things? And it is a, yeah. it's a beautiful show. That's super cool. That's wild. When did that show? Cartoons, man. When did that yeah, show come out? Awesome. <laughs> that was a long time uh, ago. Was it really? Yeah. 
something said, I just saw 2014 on there somewhere. Dude, I've seen, I've seen this thing probably. I mean, there's only 26 episodes. It's short and sweet. Uh, you could watch it, and I mean, if you did a little, a little weekend binge watching, you could watch it in two weekends. Really? You know? Yeah. And it's, it's just phenomenal. I've, sh- I've watched the whole series probably a good five or six times. Shared it with a lot of my friends. Everyone who's ever seen it has just been enamored with it. Really? As much as I, I so check far. that out. I think I, what, I, was I, what was it on? What was it? Was it on? Was it on Cartoon Network? Was it on? It's super old, man. I mean, this was nineteen eighty something. I think is when it came out. Oh, really? And so I caught it a little later. My friend. How was old? An, how old are you? I'm thirty. You're thirty, right? Yeah. My, my friend was uh, an anime buff, and so he's the one who introduced it to me. I was visiting him, excuse me, in uh, Virginia, and he was just watching. I watched it there, and just pff, it starts off slow. Okay, got to build up. Yeah, the amazing of complexity like everything the characters, good. but it's a great show. All wow. you guys who like it, you know, say like and comment oh, yeah. how great this show yeah. is. I know how I know how, how many of you think it it's sounds great. super cool. Or how much you hate from it. it on here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, we, we need know. both. You man. need both. Yeah. We need both. We need the balance. <laughs> we need the Gaussian. Ga- Gaussian. Gaussian. Yeah, Gaussian. You got it. Yeah. So Frederick Gauss, he was a mathematician. There's a fun little fable. Uh, I, I don't think it's true, but so allegedly. Um, when he was in grade school, the teacher punished everybody and said, okay, I want you to all to add up the numbers from one to 100. And so they're all sitting there at their desks, just like trying to do this thing. And then within like a minute or two, he comes up and gives the answer 500 or 5,050. And then the teacher's just like blown away. And it turns out that allegedly he invented one of the summation formulas for arithmetic, uh, arithmetic c- series. And, uh, you know, it's just a, just a kid who came up with that. And it's an arithmetic series. You just add a bunch of things together. Um, oh. and so, yeah, you add up one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six. Oh, okay. And okay. so that whole sum is equal to a small little formula, n times n minus one over two. And so allegedly he just discovered that formula when he was a little kid and then went on. To, I think the problem was much harder than that. But anyways, it's a fun little story. And he went on to do many other great mathematics things, such as creating yeah. the Gaussian distribution, which is pretty much the foundation of all probable probability theory and uh, statistics and a lot of about machine learning. So Frederick Gauss is a cool guy. Wow. That's amazing, man. Crazy. When are you going to have something named after you like these guys? Soon. Or do you have something already? Nothing? Oh. Not no, yet? No, no, no. I don't, I don't know about all that stuff. What about <laughs> Tesla? Nikolai, is that what his name? Tesla? Tesla. Tesla. Forrest was also telling me that him and Thomas Edison, I believe, have you, have, do you yeah. know? They were both similar, but Thomas Edison was more about like being known for doing stuff, for like being known for inventing, known about being more sure famous. It was than Edison. That. I think it was Bell. Was it Bell? Alexander Graham Bell. I was like, we should double check that. But, but it was. Uh, I thought it was the right. person who invented the light bulb. But basically, right. he was telling me that Tesla invented something. Basically, the, the neuron or whatever to a bat. Like he basically invented the the primal function of a battery. Right. Not an actual battery, but like the primal function or however a battery operates. Like he somehow created the concept for it. Right. And it never got invented, or it never came to fruition. But. Um, Whoever made the light bulb, whether it was Edison or Bell. No, Edison made the light bulb. He made the light bulb, right. The big famous, uh, you know, um, argument or struggle was between Tesla and Alexander Graham Bell. Oh, really? So Alexander Graham Bell was like this big, uh, yeah, you probably find it there real quick. He was the big uh, business guy. He was your your friend from New York, basically. Like Alexander Graham Bell. Okay. He's like trying to monopolize electricity, making it available to people. And his biggest flaw was that he was a champion of the direct current. And so direct right. current has a huge problem. It's not able to propagate very far, and the signal decays very quickly. Okay. And Nikola Tesla, uh, yeah, there you go. And uh, Nikola Tesla, he was all about just making things free. He was going to make right. Wi-Fi free for the mm. world, and he was just sort of idealist that just didn't really fit into the capitalist structure that America right. was coming up in. And as a consequence, he sort of ate it, and I think he ended up like killing himself or something because uh, he was really struggling with it. But uh, he was the one who was pioneering the alternating current, the and DC that's what we current, use today. Right? No, it's the, oh, the DC AC is what Graham Bell wants. Right, and he did and, the AC. Yeah, and AC is what we use today, and it's been. Uh, it's, phenomenal allows the signals to travel much much further without losing as much power so we can get these power lines for miles and miles and miles what do you think i mean was was tesla did he have some sort of form of of autism or asperger's where he where he didn't wasn't like very uh, inclusive couldn't communicate is so that is that I the read, same? I read a book on Tesla's, and it was by Margaret something. It was like a biography, and I couldn't tell whether 
she was just like overly enamored with him and was sort of sensationalizing the stories or what it was it was sort of like a fictional retelling perhaps yeah. mm-hmm. but she would describe him as being a person who would come and sit at dinner and he would like separate all of his peas to one side of the plate and put his cup here and his you know, his, uh, you know silverware perfectly straight like this right. meticulous sort of yes demonstrating autistic type tendencies or this like obsession with detail obsessive compulsive etc right. so she did describe him that way um, so if we want to take that as evidence or truth, then I would okay. say yes. Right. Yeah. I, I find that fat. I just, for some reason, I personally find that fascinating how like certain people who become, you know, turn into somebody like Nikolai Tesla, who is, who is so successful in one field like that. I, I always like am interested in their brain and like, yeah. like the, the autistic, Asperger's side of people. I mean, I know people who have that and they're just like, they get so focused on one thing. Mm. It's like, you know, you have no choice to become the best in the world at this one little thing. And then when it comes to having a conversation with somebody on the side of the road or a relative, it's like, you can't say two or three words to their yeah. 50 words. And you know? it's, it's not only the dedication, but uh, oftentimes, you know, autistic people have a disproportionately large amount of uh, neural capacity dedicated to that one thing. So, yeah. you know, while we use all of our brain for all of these things, oftentimes yeah. people uh, with autism, they use a significantly larger portion of their brain for one specific task. And that's why they've been, uh, you know, associated with doing cool things like synergism, where they like see and feel colors and senses, all their senses mixed together. Um, and, you know, when somebody hears numbers, they like the numbers have personalities to them and they like see and they have colors, et cetera, which is I agree. It's entirely yeah. fascinating. But there's actually an interesting little nugget of truth under that, and that is, uh, you know, the difference between mediocrity and greatness is just discipline, honestly. Discipline. They have a little bit of a leg up because they have, uh, you know, allegedly a, a larger comp- computational resources available, perhaps. But, right. you know, you take two people of varying skill. One person's dedicated all the time. The other one's not. You already know who's going to be more successful. That's really what it comes down to. How would you define discipline? Like, what, what creates discipline? What, yeah. is, what is discipline? I'm sort of an, uh, I, I like discipline. I like enduring hardships. And, no, oh, that's what I would call it. I would call yeah. it the willingness to endure hardships. Right. Yeah, to subject the willingness yourself to endure hardships. Yeah. And what makes somebody good at discipline? Practice. Practice. It's literally, it's just learned. It comes with confidence and time. I mean, confidence really? is built by a few string of successes. You just do it over and over and over again. And then you start to associate the positive benefits of that enduring hardships. And you start, it's like a drug. You become addicted to it. Runners, really? runners experience this kind of a thing. Yep. You know, you first go running for the first few weeks and your body's like, what the hell are you doing to me, man? Oh, this is miserable. Right. And you don't want to like go. The fucking fasting. Yeah. But after a while, your body's like, oh, wait, I feel real good. I'm getting yeah. a lot of endorphins. Like, this is good. You, you keep doing this. And yeah. you're incentivized to do it more. So just practice, man. It's everything. What's something that I, I mean, can you give me an example of something that you've taught yourself to be disciplined? I mean, well, I mean, is there a difference between teaching yourself to be disciplined at a certain thing or general discipline? I don't think so. And so, for example, I've tried to make a bunch of my lifestyle choices revolve around training my discipline. So um, I would take cold showers, for example, something yeah. that's not really yeah. enjoyable. I sleep on the floor instead of a bed, you know, things that... Really? Man, you sleep on why? the floor every day. Yeah, every not night. anymore. I have a girl here now. And we, we <laughs> hey, she doesn't her. like she sleeping said, on the floor. Fuck that, yeah. Nathan. Well, <laughs> she kind of sleeps on. We have a happy meeting. We sleep on a beanbag bed. So really, really? Put it away in the morning. Yeah, I don't. I don't own a bed. So R- why is this discipline? It's just a small little thing. You just sleep on the floor. You wake up in the morning and you feel refreshed. And I don't know. It's just part of training that mental discipline. So That's there's no there's no reason like oh, wait, wait 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 wait. It's discipline. I understand. <laughs> but what's the benefit of of what's the the physical right, is it it's good for you? benefit. Is it good for you? It has been observed that usually it's pretty good for your back, et cetera, if you're really? able to do it. Because that sounds like it would hurt That's what back. I was trying yeah, to say. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know the science behind it, to be 100% honest. But, I mean, you can find evidence supporting whatever your ideas are. Right. right? But So you found enough evidence that you out think there it's good. that you think it's good? Not Maybe not. I'll be honest. i gotta, I got to right. confess. I don't. But, here's but you're the idea. trying it to see if it's good, then. I'm just doing it because it's hard. All right, look. Okay. So you climb, you climb a mountain. You're just doing it because it's fucking hard. You don't know if it's good or bad for you. It's simply, yeah. it's simply discipline. It's just, it, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you how it happened. I was in graduate okay. school. I was coaching a yeah. boxing gym. And we had to coach in the evenings. I did research from like 8 to 5, and then I coached from 5 to 9. And then I go back to work some more and do some more things. And I was in the lab until two, three o'clock every night. And then I had to get up early in the morning and do it again. And one day I was like, why do I, I always have to go home. Like, why do I go home? It's a bed. That's really the only reason. It's like such a ball and chain, like a shackle. I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna go to sleep right here. You just roll the chair out and you just lay on the floor. It was such a liberating feeling. Like you can just, whenever you get tired, think about it. Like when you're tired, you're like, oh, uh, yeah. I gotta go home now. 
Like, why? You know, because you feel like that's where you have to go. Right. And for some people, that's fine. But I enjoyed the liberating feeling and the discipline of, you know, sleeping on the, the floor. It was worth it for me. But here's an example. Like, let's say you climb a mountain. Yeah. Okay. Why do you do it? Yeah, it's fun. It's cool, whatever. But you get to the top. It was really hard. And then you go back down. And now you experience something else in your life that's hard. And what do you say to yourself? You're like, I climbed a mountain. I think I can handle this, you know? Yeah. That's why. You just, you just put a success right there, and this builds confidence. You now have a landmark, a flag to compare the rest of your, the wow. rest of your challenges to, you know? So, so if you can challenge now. yourself to do something that's really hard and you can overcome it, then and you can do that doing multiple things, then you'll have the confidence to know if you come to another bridge that you think is going to be hard to cross, you'll have the confidence to do it, and you know you can do it because you've done other things, and you know it'll be easier. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is, is it becomes less... Um, and uh, that builds conscious. general discipline across exactly. all things. Exactly. And once you have the general discipline, it's no longer a choice. It's who you are. Right? So right. I think there's a quote, I think Benjamin Franklin maybe, he says, uh, you know, greatness isn't born. Greatness is learned. You, every single day when you're faced with a decision, you say, what would a great person do now? And then you do that until the day comes where you no longer ask yourself what a great person does. You just do what comes natural as being a great person. And so that's kind of how you think about discipline. You endure all these hardships, et cetera, and that's just like your mind. That's who you are. Someone asks you to do something and it's hard. You don't think that it's hard because you're just like, oh, easy. I've done I do this stuff all the time, you know? Yeah. That's fucking fascinating, man. But why, why the beanbag? <laughs> why, the bean why the beanbag? I'm curious. I, I'm, I wonder why the beanbag. Because we, all right, so the reason is because I slept on the floor and I didn't have a bed and I would always have like family and people come visit okay. and I needed something for <laughs> them. So I got you. this big beanbag that zips into a, a, a bed when you lay it out. Okay. I've slept then, on beanbags. I used to have, I bought two yeah. really big ass beanbags in my, yeah. my apartment in St. Pete. Cozy, man. Yeah. They are. I used to sleep on They're those awesome. at Danny's house. It was two big he red beanbags. A lot of people slept on those yeah. things. All right, so there we go. It makes a lot more sense now, That's huh? cool. Yeah. What are some of the other things that you've taught yourself discipline in? One of the things, well, I stopped doing it recently. Um, well, no, it's still halfway there, but I would set my watch to a different time and wear it upside down, right? So I just, every time I want to tell the time, I have to do like a little mental arithmetic real quick and like tell right. the time backwards, and it's just little things really? that strengthen your mind. You brush your teeth with your left hand instead of your right hand, get your brain used to doing different things, take a different route to school or work each day, you know, just always expose your brain to new things so you're not like stuck in a rut. Wow. Um, That's interesting. That's fucking awesome. I love that. I'm going to try some of these things. Yeah, yeah. I just have so many <laughs> ideas and stuff. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, let me know if it works for you, man. Yeah. <laughs> let me know how that works out. I will. I'm going to get lost on the way to work, get fired from my job. <laughs> I'm driving, trying to tell the time. Yeah. Crashes into another car. Right, I'm brushing my teeth while I'm driving to work on a new route. And I'm like trying to do it all at once. That's fucking awesome, The cops dude. pull me over. They're like, why are you brushing your teeth with your left hand? And where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. I'm just trying a new route to work. <laughs> I might try it, though. Wow, man. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, I think if you think hard about your life, you probably subject yourself to some hardships unconsciously. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, in the common day-to-day -day things that you do, there's something that you want <clears throat> enough that you voluntarily put yourself through a hardship to get it. And once you identify those things, you can just exercise them a little bit more. And you say, well, yeah, I was going to do this thing that was hard. Now I'm going to do that thing and then do five push-ups every time before I do it. Just whatever. Okay. Small yeah. little thing. Yeah. Just challenge yourself, you know? <laughs> For me, it's like I, I personally, I feel like, I've always tried to found like find what makes up some days when I wake up and I go through a day and I feel fucking great, full of energy, happy talking to people, like super energetic. And then yeah. there's the next day I'm just pissed off in a bad mood. I feel tired, slow. I want to figure out like what makes me like the first day and not like the other day. So I like constantly tried to figure out like what patterns, you know, what, what, path I took that one day and what I can replicate to make that thing happen again. And I feel like I've never been able to figure it out. Well, uh, there's, there's a great idea and there's a lot of truth behind that. I think that there do exist some, some general norms, which are good ideas, but besides you know, drugs, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took a, a, a systems biology course yeah. and it's the notion of like studying the whole body as a system and each component is communicating with other components via, you know, DNA, you have transcriptions, et cetera, mm -hmm. messengers and proteins all communicating and you try and model this phenomena to see how things happen. Mm -hmm. And for example, one of the phenomena that we studied is like the sleep wake cycle. There's a certain part in the brain and that sleep wake cycle gets trained and tuned to the amount of light that we're presented with, which is why we're trained to get tired at night and stay awake during the day, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea is that there is just so much going on 
you're just not going to figure it out, man. There's just like randomness. There's just hormone, random changes. The weather changes. You can't control that. And for whatever reason, some uh, some bacteria or something flares up. But not right. enough to make you sick, but just enough to like make some hormonal response. Like there, Stuff you can't see, just anything. Exactly. You know, there's a few good rules of thumb. Eat healthy and exercise and sleep. Right. But that also, but, that also pisses me off, too, because there's this uh, one guy I know who's extremely fat and overweight and doesn't take care of himself. I know he doesn't get as much sleep as I do, and I know he doesn't do he doesn't exercise, doesn't go to the gym, and he's always got ten times more energy than I do. Yeah. I'm like, why am I tired? I went to the gym ten times this week. All I ate was broccoli, and yeah. you have ten times more energy than me. Why? Is it genetics? Is it like you know? It's, it's just weird. the drive he has to it's get that crazy. money. Easy. It's discipline, man. Yes. Discipline. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of truth behind that. I mean, there's just discipline. There's yeah. just a genetic disposition. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who knows, uh, man? Before I wanted to ask, like, what are some cool projects mm-hmm. or things you've worked on? Like, so what are some of the coolest stuff you've worked on or oh, seen or like, uh, or whatever, something like that? Mm. Something like that. Uh, let me think about that one. That's a little tricky. So, can you narrow it down for me a little bit? Like, I don't know. Like you said, so you were working on the nine one one calling thing or whatever. You know, whatever that is, a program or whatever. So, like, what are some of the things you've done over all these years? Like, really cool projects or things you guys came up with, or like, what are some of the things that stick out in your mind? Some of the fun, yeah, the more fun, exciting so, things. So, I mean, that you like, yeah. Unfortunately, the majority of my research is kind <clears> of like more theoretical and philosophical so it hasn't okay. been to apply it's more like you know what is learning what is memory etc but you're gonna get roasted for that question by the way <laughs> that's right so maybe it's maybe it's things like you figured out or algorithms yeah, or but, whatever it is but in business you got to apply nobody's gonna pay me to sit in a room and think right, right well except right. for the government and they don't even do that much anymore either with grants right so uh we got we got a business and we have things so i can tell you about some of the stuff some of the other things that we that we've done there um so in addition Something else that we're exploring right now. Let's see what else. What's cool? All right. So, um, the Department of Transportation is very interested in uh, safety and maintenance of the roads, highways, bridges, etc. Mm-hmm. So there it turns out that there's some civil engineers who have just a <clears throat> myriad, just a plethora of all kinds of data on this. You know, they have speed bump sensors on the highways, which measure the width of the axles, the speed of the cars, whether there's a trailer or not, just all kinds of things. And uh, one thing that you might have heard, there was a bridge that actually fell recently, and it was a lot of deaths and injuries, and there was a crack, like a full two-inch crack in the bridge a few days before that people weren't observing. So they have this big new initiative where they had to take drones, and the drones are flying around these bridges and just taking pictures of all these things and monitoring you know, what the bridge looks like. But now they've got hundreds and thousands of pictures, and what are they going to do? Just sit here and watch these videos all day, every single day? So we develop uh, machine learning algorithms and techniques which will uh, isolate and detect where there are cracks or damages and the degree of the cracks is as degree one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that can uh, you know save lives. And that's a really boring thing, isn't it? No, Sorry. that's actually no, that's very important. fascinating because I work lives. construction. <laughs> oh. So that like kind of hits a, a certain spot that make, made some sense to nice. me. But like how do you... So how do you come up with something, or how do you implement? So you just code some sort of program that learns this thing, and yeah. So I mean, most machine learning algorithms have uh, they all follow the same formula. Okay, you have a whole bunch of data. Yeah. You pass it through some, for the sake of this conversation, a black box, a neural okay. network, and it makes a prediction. Yeah. All right. Then what you do is you take a look at this prediction and you say whether it was right or wrong, or hara- or rather how far away how far away it was from what you wanted it to do. Then you do the most complicated thing in all of machine learning, essentially, and that's you calculate the the, the error, rather. You, you use an algorithm called backpropagation, and that finds how you change the black box such that if you present that same image or piece of information to it again, the output will be closer to what you want. And that's it. So you give it something, mm-hmm. it makes a mistake, you go, eh, you made a mistake, do it a little bit better this way, present the same thing, and it'll do it better. So with those images, we just show it all the images, and it's just, it doesn't know anything at first. It's like a right. baby. It's just, just touching right. things and guessing, making all kinds of mistakes, and we yeah. just inform it little by little. Well, this was wrong, this was right, and then it starts learning those features that we talked about. What are the features of a crack? It starts learning to extract those features that define what a crack is, and now it's presented with an image, it's able to identify cracks. Man, that's so crazy that's to cool, me. cool, huh? Like, it just thinks for itself. It's just, I don't know, it's so crazy. Well, no, no, that's, that's actually a really important part, right? So these things that do really cool stuff, they are super narrow. 
Like, you know, you go to a Bank of America ATM and you put your check in and it scans it for you automatically yeah. and detects, you know, and it seems super cool. That, that's all that thing can do. That thing's right. not going to go outside and learn to play basketball or do your taxes, right? I mean, right. That, that's the notion of transfer learning, and that's like one of the holy grails of AI that we've been exploring, and we're very far away from really understanding that wholesomely. So these, yeah. and that's one of the things that I'd like to just sort of share with people is, you know, it's okay to be afraid of, you know, AI and it's what, what it can do in the future, but just remember, we're, we're really far away from any sort of Terminator things happening, and for the very far future, as far as I'm aware, Anytime we're doing any research with any AI that has the potential to do scary things, you just unplug the Ethernet cable, okay? Yeah. So if it ever goes rampant or does something amazing, all you got to do is unplug the computer, right? But as soon as you have it plugged into the Internet, then allegedly I, I agree with the, the concerns that are there, right? If something's like self-replicating, it gets into the Internet, that can be really dangerous, no doubt. But that's why we just exercise a little bit of discipline and restraint yeah. and unplug the Ethernet whenever you're doing you know, advanced AI research. No big deal. Did you hear about um, the face, when Facebook was creating that a new AI, uh, I think it was for customer support, that was supposed to talk to Facebook users and try to like be uh, act as a support for Facebook? Um, and it was like an AI and I believe there was two different AIs, yeah. and they created their own language. I'm really glad you brought oh, that yeah. up. So that's, that's like, again, one of the, the problems in AI is sensationalism. They didn't invent their own language, and it was, adver it was advertised that way, and it was nothing even remotely that cool. Hmm. Um, so Really? Yeah. So we're, that's one of the – but that's one of the problems is what are you going to do? I mean, you're a consumer, and you're supposed to trust the people giving us news, and that's right. one of the problems. See, why and this – Genius Forrest over here. He's the one who told me they created their own language. I was like blown away by it. The news article and it's said cool that. to talk about. Oh, right. I remember hey, all the news articles did say that. Yeah, right. you're so right. in their defense, in his defense, and right. everyone. Right. I mean, what are you supposed to do? You're not a machine learning expert. You're not going to like right. go and read the papers and the reports and look into what right. it meant. So you're, you're saying that, that they did not create. So Two AIs did not create their own language. Define their own language, right? I mean, uh, okay. we, we feel like they're in there like conspiring against mankind and humanity, yeah. and they they advertise it that way for clickbait, you know. But what actually happened then? And so the, the details I don't exactly remember. It was a little okay. bit ago. Um, um, but in a nutshell, I mean, the idea was basically that they were sending signals back and forth in a certain way that it seemed as though the responses were predictable. So it sends a certain signal, and then it interprets it and responds in a way that there was structure and meaning behind the things going back and forth. Right. It's not like we discovered what they were saying and they're conspiring and they have their own language. They just found patterns in the signals that they're sending back and forth with each other. Just as much as the image acquisition thing I described you earlier is going to find patterns in what defines a crack. They're just doing what they're programmed to do, find patterns in the sensory input. That's all any intelligence system does. But were they, were they initially programmed or expected to communicate in any form with each other? I don't know the details of the full experiment, so I would right. have to exercise some academic uh, yeah. restraint here and right, not, right, right. Out, not say what I don't know. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, either way, I mean, it's still pretty interesting to find out, you know, that they were, they were communicating in a way that they didn't expect them to, and it was AI, but who knows? It could have just been clickbait headlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would, uh, for now, I would um, caution that as being clickbait headlines, and unfortunately for the, the unforeseeable future, we all have to just suffer from that, because... We're not all experts in everything. You see someone, oh, eating a piece of chocolate it makes you healthier and drinking a glass of wine. And you see all these studies which are based off of poor statistics, which then some, I think, oh, man, I remember who it was, like Al Roker or someone. He was, like, on some news thing. It was super embarrassing. He's like, well, yeah, you know, I think what the thing is nowadays is you just, you just find whatever scientific publication supports your own beliefs. Yeah. And I was like, that is the exact opposite of what science is supposed to be. Yeah. You don't just cherry pick evidence to support your own convictions it's the right. exact opposite scientifically minded people change their own convictions based on the evidence you don't just go find evidence to make you feel good about what your own right, ideas right. are right oh uh, yeah yeah and so what are you going to do when the people who are advertising the news think that way right. it's you know? crazy it's unfortunate do you think there will ever be a shift in like I hope in so, general man. population understanding this kind of We're stuff we keep championing these these ideas advertising to as many people as we can and you know maybe people start thinking differently i think you should be president Nathan Clark, hell yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote. I would never want that much responsibility. Hell no. <laughs> but it would be good. Maybe you can clone yourself. I already have a clone now because I'm a cyborg. Wait, I'm not a cyborg. Have you ever thought about cloning? <laughs> yeah, of course that's funny because then I can make an army of me and take over the world. Yeah. Everybody wants to do that, right? Right, for sure. Yeah, or I could, uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of, uh, lots of fun, entertaining things that can happen with cloning. What about, um, 
What about Elon Musk's neural net? I forget what it's called, but it's the basically he talks about on a, on a phone. Your only output is your two thumbs, and with right. this net, I forget what, it, what the exact word for it is. Yeah, I heard about it, it and goes uh, like over your brain or whatever, and it basically you like live yeah. in Facebook or you I'm live in social media. Super suspicious of it. It sounds like a great really? idea, and I am super happy. What is it called again? Neuralink. Yeah. Neuralink. Neuralink. No, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy that he's. Someone's got to start doing it, no doubt, and it's a great idea, and we'll get there eventually, right? Yeah. But you know, because this is the, the fundamental technology behind that is very similar to what I was sharing with you before about putting ideas in someone else's brain. You have to know where to send the stimulus. You have to learn patterns in the electromagnetic, you know, waves that happens mm-hmm. as people think. Map these to some sort of functional output like it's an incredibly difficult complicated task yeah but we can do it we've done all we went we went to the moon right we can do all yeah. kinds of hard things so yeah i like that he's doing it but i don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon you don't uh, seem to be, be you don't strike me as a big fan of elon musk um i think he's doing really good things for the world and i am very supportive of his missions and his ambitions um, I've just read a little bit about him and he does some, he does some really, really intelligent things. Like he surrounds himself with experts. He knows what he doesn't know and he surrounds himself with experts and mm-hmm. he's well informed because he's humble and I respect that. However, um, but this is the case with pretty much anything as I think there's hundreds and thousands of people who can do his job better and most of his position is just luck. And I think, but that's the case with most everything in life. I mean, people who are where they are, think about what their true qualities are, such as your friend who's really wealthy. Right. You know, I don't think there's any really distinct characteristics that make one person shine phenomenally more than other people. There's hundreds and thousands of people with the exact same characteristics, but their life circumstances were such that, you know, they were born in Africa. Right. And for whatever reason, they just can't come here and be awesome and champ- and, and take over these things, right? So, right. Um, and when I look at him, I think he's great and I like what he's doing, but I just, I'm sort of against, I guess, sort of the, um, the idealization that people have sort of made him to be like, oh, he's the big savior of the future kind of right, thing. Right, right. Because I think that uh, handicaps ourselves. It makes you feel like you can't do it or something. He's just a guy who works hard, surrounds himself by experts, and got really lucky. And anybody else yeah. can do that too. Yeah. Know? But I still think what he's doing is great and I respect yeah. him. And, you know, I have nothing bad to say. I just, yeah. 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 Do you ever think that you'll be as world renowned as Elon Musk? <laughs> I don't think so. No. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I like, uh, I don't know. I just like simple things. Like sometimes I just think about like going out to just like a little farm or a small little village somewhere and just helping people, teaching math in some school and just like laughing with people and loving yeah. and feeling life a little bit. But then sometimes I wake up and I'm just like, I want to go climb a mountain, conquer the world, right? So it's right. a tough balance. We, we all have to find what's right for us. But I, I'm not 100% driven and just ambitious to step over people and change the world. That's not me. I'm a little more yeah. of just a, you know, like Trigon, like Vash the Stampede. That's my guy. That's my hero. That's the kind okay. of guy I want to be. He just wants to live a happy life and make others better. And that's kind of what I want to do, you know? So I don't know. If it happens, that'd be cool. I'll embrace it to try and help the world in whatever way. But I'm not really working for anything like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's not my ambitions. That's cool, man. That's really interesting. What do you guys want to do? That's a good question. That's a good question. I don't know what I, I, I've always kind of wanted to do the same thing. I've always, like my only skill has ever been kind of like, you know, making videos with my friends when I was a little, when I was younger in high school, all I did was I run around. You did skate, that, man. I ran I'm, around uh, skateboarding with a video camera. I'm astounded with what, you, what you've done here, man. It's really right. impressive. Yeah, it impresses me even because I've known Danny since back then. And it's like <laughs> I knew him. I'm, I'm impressed of, that he did. We were like, <laughs> I'm one of the autistic people who but, just stuck with the same thing since that's all I ever known. And I just like I was on that path and I had so much momentum. It's like why, God. Go yeah, in another he, direction. It's beautiful, man. It's working for you. Right. He yeah. found the part he was good at. You know, he wasn't always the best by BMX or skateboarder, mm-hmm. but he was the best at, at filming everybody and putting it together and editing the videos together. And it just, yeah, it worked out good. And it's transitioned more into making it look cool to actually yeah. providing valuable context. Very good. Yeah. Because <laughs> like you got to live in society, here, yeah. right? So you got to find some way to make what yeah. you do valuable to others. But mm-hmm. I really like that you mentioned this right at the end because. I struggle with this sometimes because I have friends out at uh, you know Facebook and Google, and they're like, Nathan, you got to come out here, and you'll be challenged, and you'll grow so much more, and you'll really thrive out here. And I have absolutely no doubt. I mean, I've been out there. I went to the Google Brain Project. I've met some of like the f- astounding The Google people. Brain Project? Yeah, so it's a research group at Google that does AI. You know, I've okay. gone there and okay. met with them, talked about them, my research, their research. And it's these people are astounding. They think in ways that's amazing, and I love it. Um, but... 
I think the notion of success is uh, a little bit conflated in, in our world with mm -hmm. just status and prestige, right? Because mm -hmm. for me, success is just watching others grow and, and succeed. I like to teach. I like to share what yeah. I'm passionate about. I like to just help others. And so for me, if I went to a small little village and just saw some people's lives you know, flourish and watch them be really happy, that'd be success yeah. for me. And so that's why I like what you're doing is, you know, you know, whether you learn one thing or many things, you're happy with what you're doing, you're right. making a difference for some people. And I mean, is there any other way to really define success other than that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it I also know. has a lot to do with, with your early life too. I mean, like how you, you were developed as a young kid, like what you're, what you were put up against growing up, right? I mean, if you, I mean, did you grow up with siblings or anything like that? Or were you an only child? I had two siblings. I was the youngest. Do you think um, that had anything to do with how you turned out? Like with what you wanted to do, like learning science or getting, learning all this stuff, like, like being better than your siblings, competitiveness. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times, like how people grow up, I feel like that has a lot to do with how they, how they end up or the path they take. Yeah. There's a lot of psychological research behind uh, children and, and where they fit in. And, you know, there's correlation between being the middle child and being the troublemaker and then being the youngest and then needing attention and then being the yeah. oldest and then, yeah. you know, being somewhat altruistic sometimes because you have to help the younger siblings. Right? So there's all kinds of like little interesting correlations. None of them are absolute or anything. But I would say that that evidence is enough to say absolutely. Your upbringing, the number of siblings you have in your position among them is going to significantly uh, modify who you become. And what you determine is success, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, anything else we should cover? I mean, we've been on there for like an hour, and two, almost two hours now. Almost, yeah. Probably yeah, about right. close to it. This was a good. This was good, man. Yeah, thank yeah, you. This for is everyone like, who uh, stuck through it with us. This is one of the best uh, discussions I think we've ever had. I'm, yeah, I'm like, I can't rate uh, rewatch this a couple times. For oh, sure. I'm gonna watch it a hundred times. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> man. Uh, I'm cool. really um, honored and uh, grateful for yeah. the opportunity to share what I love. I'm very passionate about this stuff, and it's nice to be able to have a um, you know a, a platform and a microphone to. Share what I love. Everybody Absolutely, wants to do that, yeah, so. man. I would love to have you on here again. You know, eventually. You know, sure. next time you're down here. Yeah, share with us time. some cool shit you're working on down the line, or you yeah, know, some new shit that's going on. 2019 is lining up to be a very busy year for us. We have a lot of contracts on the line. So awesome, really? Yeah, yeah. And we'll uh, definitely everybody, touch back. Uh, Nusai Labs. Nusai is a company in Tallahassee. If you're looking for any data science or machine learning um, services, if you'd like to get insight as a service, as we call it please reach out to Nathan at newside.co or Google and uh, contact your guys here. We'd love to offer some services. Awesome. That's awesome, man. Cool. Well, thank you, brother. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thank it's you. good to call you a friend, Nathan. All right, Nathan. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Cheers.